Good morning, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of Coffee and Something Stronger. My name is Cody Norris. I'm the Executive Director of Georgia Interface Power and Light. Coffee and Something Stronger is a coffee chat style interview show where we sit down with practitioners, faith leaders, academics, and talk at the intersections of faith, climate, and justice. And this morning, we have on a good friend of Gipple and a good friend of mine, Kaya Chatterjee, the executive director of the U.S. Climate Action Network, of which Gipple is a member of Kaya. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for having me. So uh, before we dive in, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into the work that you're doing now? Yeah. So I started my career working at, uh, at NASA um, uh, at the headquarters here in DC and really thought I would have a career as a scientist and really changed my career on one specific day when uh, you know I was standing and talking to my colleague and we were looking at Arctic sea ice data and uh, we were just kind of chatting about how our weekends had been and this data came in, we were staring at it and we thought it was wrong. Uh, and we called over to uh, Goddard Space Flight Center where they had been working on it. And we said, this looks wrong. And they said, no, that's it. Um, and that was back in 2002. And so since then, there's been such a huge decrease in Arctic sea ice that you can't even see that that was a low year. But I, it was shocking to me at the time. Um, really, it was 2012 when just like, you know, there's Arctic sea ice like, like this and 2012 went like that. Uh, and it's just continued to just, you know, force us to make new charts. And everything was just happening so much faster than what I had been taught in grad school that I just went to my boss that day. And I was like, I, I really need to work on, on climate change. Um, and that was sort of where, where the trajectory began. But of course, I was still in government then. And it took me a while to realize that, like, the, the issue was not anything to do with people not having enough information. You know, there's this thing called the knowledge deficit model, um, which, is, which is this like theory that like, if you give people information, they'll change. And it's just proven false across a range of issues. And certainly on climate, it became really clear that that is not what's going on. The problem isn't that people don't know. The problem is actually that they do know. Uh, and the problem is that they know and that they're, they're making a lot of money off of the status quo, the people who have power. And of course, we've seen that in recent weeks with Senator Manchin from West Virginia in particular, just benefiting so much financially from keeping extractive dirty fossil fuels going in this country, that it's that that is the real problem. Not it, and and it always was. And that realization is what led me into the activist space uh, and away from from being a scientist, although I did love working at NASA. We're very grateful that you made the change over to this work. Um, uh, and as we get started this morning, I think you have a reading to offer. And so I'll ask you to offer that and we'll dive in. Yeah, so I am here in uh, in D.C., Piscataway and Nacotchtank land right now. And um, one of our struggles here in D.C. for justice is uh, is a struggle for full voting rights and statehood. Uh, and we hope to be called the Douglas Commonwealth one day soon. And Frederick Douglass uh, has a home, had a home here in D.C. And I'm, I, I'm going to read a quote from Frederick Douglass uh, that I think people will find very familiar, but it's one I come back to a lot. Uh, and he said, if there is no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom and yet depreciate agitation are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. This struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. Yeah, thank you for that. What about that Frederick Douglass quote, quote speaks to you, and, and how does it ground your work? I think we're at a point where, and this connects to what I was sp speaking about before, that the problem isn't that people don't know, it's that they do know. So that means that what we are in is actually a struggle against oppression. Uh, and a struggle against oppression is something that we actually as humanity know a lot about. Uh, and whether that is the struggle to stop the enslavement of 
Black people from Africa in this country or the struggle to end apartheid or the struggle for independence in India. These are struggles we actually have studied, we know about, and we know how to do. And the wisdom that we gain from people who came before us and have prevailed, I mean, not completely, obviously, you know, you know, I think it was Nelson Mandela that spoke about when you climb one bill, one hill, there are more to climb in front of you, but, but not that everything is fixed, but, but we have incredible leaders who, who we can learn from. And I think for me, reading from some of those leaders gives us some insight into what we must do and really presents a call to action um, that, that goes beyond really holding signs even or dedicating our, our, you know, our free time to this, but really calls to us in a deeper way um, and even, even a more spiritual way, like a more a way that, that calls to our whole selves and not just, you know, like some kind of like professional self or activist self, but like our whole selves to be a part of this struggle. So when you, when you talk about like what it will take of us and what it means um, uh, to agitate and what it means to really make a demand of those who have power, that really takes our whole beings in, in, in community with other beings to make that happen. Um, you know, in the quote, he talks about like, it, it's, it, it is, you know, in a moral struggle, in a physical struggle, it, you have, you, there, there is a lot of work to be done. It doesn't just happen on its own. It, it just, it requires a lot of us. Yeah, yeah, definitely true. And you talked a little bit about kind of this spiritual piece, your whole self. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how does spirituality kind of fit into your journey? And if there are some tenets of your spirituality that also ground you in the work and, and come to bear? Yeah, so um, I have, I grew up in Montgomery County, Maryland, which is a suburb of DC. And I actually thought I was Jewish until I was like nine, or maybe not nine, it was like five, but it was a while. Uh, Cause I was like, I, I go to Passover dinner, I find a cracker, I get a dollar, obviously I'm Jewish. And I just <laughs> discovered one day at the Jewish community center was my mom was like filling out a form and said, we weren't Jewish, that we weren't Jewish. And, and I was, and, you know, and I was, and I said, well, what do you mean we're not Jewish? And she's, it's just whole like, life is a lie. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> I was like, she's like, we're not Jewish. And she's, and she's just kind of waved me away. And, you know, we get, we later on, I was like, what do you mean we're Jewish? And she said, we're Hindu. And I was like, don't change the subject. Uh, Cause like to me, <laughs> there was no like conflict there. Uh, like we were very obviously both things. Like we went to Pujo and we had, you know, Hindu practices, but also I went to Passover dinner. And I, I guess I would say for me, like the actual like formulation of a specific religion has never mattered that much. And I, and I find that I can draw from all of them, although I do identify as being Hindu. Uh, it's just that like, I feel like there are, are elements of, of, uh, of spirituality that I can take from many places, whether they're just like pearls of wisdom or practices. Um, and I find that like kind of just the basic practices of Hinduism are actually just like physically necessary for doing this work, at least for me, like, like meditation, like yoga, like these, these are things for me that are just like things that I can like anchor myself in before going into the world and doing the work. And that also are like our community practices that I really believe are important um, and in the end, I think are like also like very similar to practices and in, in other faiths of just like the ability to sit still with oneself, um, you know, the ability to, um, to, to just, to, you know, to, to not have sensory overload, um, and yeah. to, to just, a, a, a move to simplicity. Uh, you know, th these are the kinds of things for me that really inform, my way of preparing for direct action and agitation and struggle so that I know that it's coming not just from like a place of wanting to agitate, but it's coming like from a, from an anchored place of like understanding the greater struggle in front of us and, and what must be done in any given moment in order to prevail. Yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about U.S. CAN or the U.S. Climate Action Network generally. I remember, I think in 2018 was my first U.S. Climate Action Network meeting, and I remember uh, coming there and like 
hearing you speak and the vision for what US CAN was and thinking, yeah, this is going to be an incredible network and truly probably the most important network that we're a part of. And as executive director of US CAN, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about like what's the importance of a national network like US CAN and why does it matter? Yeah. So so we are we hover around like 200 member organizations and we bring folks together, as you were saying, like at annual meetings. And really for me, the heart of what our network is, is, is you, our members, and the relationships between our members. And that is something that uh, is really the foundation, I believe, of any movement, is, is human relationships. Uh, and the more love there is in those relationships, the stronger the movement, mm. and the more likely we will prevail. Uh, because things get tough in movements. And if you know somebody, you're more likely to reach out in conversation and learning and from a space of love than to get mad and call a reporter when some, when you perceive yeah. somebody has, has wronged you. Um, and so like the core that the core thing we, we work on is those relationships. We're always trying to, in different ways, in different spaces, bring our members together so that those relationships are deepened. So we don't want it to be that just like that I, Kay, as executive director, know people in the network. We want it that the network knows each other and is really, you know, that really strong web of connections um, that are truly like loving connections because, because people know each other, have broken bread together, have karaoke together, have... <laughs> you know, have, have, you know, like really like genuinely have affection for each other. And from that place of love, you can build to alignment and start to work through differences, whatever they are on like policy and, and differences seem less important if you're starting from a basis of love and then you can get to alignment. And when you get to alignment, you can really start to be in solidarity and, and change the world and produce a different kind of environment for ourselves. But for us, our starting point is, is those relationships. And that's where we feel like we, we need to, we, we have to make an investment in that because it's the base of the movement. And from there, we, you know, with a strong base, so much is possible. And so we, we always spend a lot of time on the base of, of, of relationships and, and love. Yeah. No, relationships are the work in a way. Yeah. Um, I wonder too, if you could talk a little bit about, I mean, does relationship building is for all these catalyzing moments and for all of these efforts, including things like arm in arm. And you talked about, um, you know, the importance of meditation and, and getting centered before doing direct action. And I wonder if you could talk about, like, what's the importance of direct action and arm in arm now and like why the shift to, hey, we need to start doing this kind of a thing. Yeah. So within US CAN, you know, we have a goal of centering equity and racial justice in all we do, but we also have a goal of like meeting our climate targets. And we believe that 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 putting racial justice at the heart of our work is how we meet those climate targets. And when we took a look maybe three years ago, two years ago, we started to look, it was, I think it was three years ago, we started to look at like, are we actually, we were in the middle of a five-year strategic plan. Are we actually set up in this five-year plan to achieve what we set out to do by focusing on these relationships and this alignment and this, and this change in the world? And we came to the conclusion that we actually needed to do more. So we launched something called Arm in Arm. And this was our members who came together. You know, we put an open call out, who wants to come think about this with us? And we spent a year studying, going back to what I was saying before, studying the civil rights movement, studying the anti-apartheid movement, studying what's happening now in Hong Kong and Chile, all around the world in social movements. And we came to the conclusion that actually, you know, we are connected as a network and we are aligned and we actually need to be out there as a network. And so this is a project of US CAN that is about that building off of our connection and our alignment that, that we already love each other and that we already know what needs to happen in the world and using that base to really change things. And so we have, uh, we have uh, uh, an objective, we have a plan, we uh, have, you know, we have trainings every month that anyone can attend to plug in. And really we're, we're three years in, but the first two years have been during the pandemic. 
um, and with this frame of like, we need disruptive humanitarianism. We need to disrupt the systems that are failing to provide us with clean air, with clean water, with a, a, a livable future, with stable jobs, with housing, with shelter. Like we need to disrupt the, the system in place that denies us those things, that takes away those things and put in place another system. And so we've had a, a you know, since people have become to get, become vaccinated, we, we brought three buses of people out uh, in solidarity with the struggle against line three. We've done massive actions on the Mountain Valley pipeline in solidarity with indigenous and black and Appalachian leadership down there. We've done actions um, uh, on a uh, Southern company uh, focusing on, uh, on coal ash spills and more, which is closer to your backyard. Uh, and we're planning in February, a national assembly um, that will be an action and, uh, and two days of pretty intense training in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and we, we are really looking to get ourselves ready and everyone is welcome to join arm and arm. It's not just us can members. So, so any, any three people can start an arm and arm hub. Everyone is welcome to join. You just have to go through our anti-racism training and our nonviolent direct action training so that we're all coming from the same place. Um, yeah. and so, so we're, so that's where we're really going to launch an escalation so that, you know, this past summer we had, we had a moment where there were 60 raging wildfires happening at once. Whole communities have been turned to ashes on the West. And at the same time, Louisiana is still nowhere near, uh, on its feet from Ida and people, people, were, babies were drowning in uh, in houses in New Jersey and New York. So, so we were at a point where it was like the climate crisis and this happens, you know, you know, because we know it will continue to happen. We have an advantage, which is that we can plan for next summer and really to be ready to escalate as the community of people who believe in the need to put racial justice at the heart of this work, who believe in the need to, to urgently address the climate crisis, we can come together next summer. And Arm and Arm is really the framework with which to do that. So everyone's welcome yeah. to join us in Birmingham in February. Everyone should go if you're listening to this, uh, do that. And we'll also be putting out announcements come January and February to remind you of that. Um, talk about dysfunctional systems uh, and systems that aren't working. Let's talk about federal climate action. And, um, you know, I have, I follow what you've been doing and you've been good about uh, chasing down some legislators and asking them about supporting uh, the Build Back Better Act and to support climate action. And I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about like how that's been going. You already mentioned briefly sort of uh, mansion and the money that's being made off of fossil fuels. Yeah, so uh, thanks to the great state of Georgia, we are in a position where we have a very narrow uh, um, margin and could get something done on climate and care. And as you mentioned, this is the, the Build Back Better plan that sometimes is called the Reconciliation Bill, sometimes is called the $3.5 trillion bill that has within it suite of things that are deeply interconnected. Um, and so, and I think that's one thing about where we are now, as opposed to when I started my career even, which is that we're really experiencing these impacts of climate change. So it's so clear that it's intersectional. And so when people are, you know, when we have uh, migrants coming across the border, when you really dig into those stories, it's because there was drought, there wasn't food, violence became the norm and people weren't safe. They had to get out. That's a climate story. When we, when you talk Talk to people about health. Their kids have asthma. They can't afford their albuterol. Asthma rates go through the roof, not only with air pollution, but also with heat waves, you know, which, which exacerbates air pollution, um, which, which, you know, and these heat waves also exacerbate, you know, heart disease, um, you know, all of the, all of those kind of diseases that have become unbelievably expensive in this country to medicate. And so within that bill is also the ability to negotiate lower drug prices. So that like, like in Canada, when the patent expires, we're not still playing, paying 
that hundreds of thousands of dollars and, you know, in, you know, from an insurance company, but, but even out of pocket, even like for my inhaler that I get is a hundred dollars, which is definitely something yeah. that's been exacerbated when we have heat waves in DC. And so, so the package include also includes a lot of stuff on climate. Um, and what we've seen in particular is that the pharmaceutical industry who want us to keep paying really high prices for, albuterol for asthma, for insulin, for diabetes, and the fossil fuel industry who do not want us to transition to fuels that don't cause the climate crisis, to clean fuels, to renewable fuels, have put all of their energy via the United States Chamber of Commerce into stopping this thing. And so even Senator Manchin, who said, you know, at the beginning of this conversation, he said, I want to spend $4 trillion. And now he's like, nope, not going to do it. Well, what happened between those two moments in time? The U.S. Chamber of Commerce came out, largely fueled by the pharmaceutical industry and the fossil fuel industry, to stop us from taking care of each other and, and stop us from taking care of ourselves. The whole bill is paid, you know, so, so there's all this stuff going on. Like the whole bill is paid for simply right. by closing tax loopholes of very wealthy people who are spending their spare time going to space for fun. Like I started my career at NASA. That is not a good use of our of our society's dollars, um, and that's what that is. People aren't paying their taxes, and they're they're accumulating their money instead of paying their fair share, and they're going on joy rides to space. Yeah, and so like that's really the struggle we're in federally right now is that we need. You know, and and there's and I think it's important also to mention the attacks on voting rights that are happening and that and that are not being fixed at the federal level. And so so you have this combination of like the people are really clear of this country. The people want this thing. Like polling shows that everybody knows that right. people want it, but that doesn't get represented in our democracy because of flaws in our democracy. And then what we have is a situation where greedy corporations are holding all the power and we have to struggle against that. Yeah, well, I wanna zoom out one more layer and ask you because of your position, you know a bit about what's going on on the international scale. And I wonder if you could talk about, um, you know, the U.S. and compared to other nations, also COP26 is coming up. You know, what are your hopes coming out of that? And, you know, what should people be looking at? Yeah. So these two things are very related. So U.S. CAN is part of this larger network, CAN International. So we're, it's called a node. So we're the U.S. node of CAN International. So we're a part of this huge international network of climate activists. And our job as the U.S. activists, first and foremost, is to get the U.S., to actually like have trustworthy numbers put forward and trustworthy commitments. The, the rest of the world is very understandably dubious. The United States is the only country that's ever pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement. Yes, we came back when Biden was back, but it's really hard to trust somebody who keeps failing you. Uh, and so we have a real trust deficit with the rest of the world. And that's part of why passing this piece of legislation is so important before COP happens, COP being the UN climate meetings, the conference of parties. So, the, so when that meeting happens, one thing is showing up in, 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 with an offering that is not laughable because it's just words, right? Like we want it to have actual legislation behind it. Um, uh, and that means it's got to have that second piece of the bill, you know, uh, you know, not just the piece that has a bunch of highways that ExxonMobil wrote, but also the piece that <laughs> has the climate work. Um, and then I would say, you know, a, a lot of the work that's done at COP is work of, uh, is, is anti-racist work, is decolonization work. Um, and I think that that framing is, um, is, is starting to be understood more since the, the, the uprisings of last summer in this country, which is just a history of like, what happened in this world? Well, Europeans uh, went to other places took them over, stole people, put them in bondage, stole all of the resources of all these countries, amassed them in either Europe or places that had been almost completely taken over by people of European descent, settler colonial countries like the United States, like Australia uh, and New Zealand and Canada. And that is where the wealth sits. And the impact, and, the, and that is where the climate crisis was caused. It, and that is the kind of the origins of like our completely unsustainable way of living. And the result of that is that the impacts are mostly felt in other places. Um, and in places where 
there is there is very little greenhouse gas emissions and a lot of impacts and that is what's happening around the world and like you know and and to my own family's history my family is was originally from what's now bangladesh what my parents were refugees because of colonialism um uh and and were forced from their homes and and it's just like the the world order was just messed with with colonialism and what you need to do is is decolonize things and that doesn't mean we have to like go back in time it just means look at what's happening right now there's still colonization happening now like line three is yeah. still colonization it's still like it, those are treaty rights and we're slamming a dirty pipeline through it. And, and the government is favoring this foreign company, this Canadian company and doing that. So there's still colonization happening. It's not a thing of the past, but we can still decolonize by anchoring ourselves in like what is fair and what is just and what are, what are our origins and how do we come to terms with this, you know, with this situation. And that's where, you know, you get a lot of, uh, of the normal dialogue in kind of like in, in the United States being like, oh, well, China should do more and uh, they just want money from us. But it's like, you know, it's just like COVID. If we don't actually help the rest of the world because we happen to sit where there are resources, we can't solve this problem, just like COVID. You get variants in the case of COVID. You yeah. don't solve the climate crisis if we don't actually create sort of a global sense of a Green New Deal, not just a united sense of a Green New Deal and a transition where we take care of each other. We have to begin to extend that to the rest of the world. And those conversations get very dicey. Um, and when you look at like you know uh, Chinese emissions today, they do start to rival the United States today. But if you even look at a 10-year period, much less a 20-year period or a 30-year period, or look at yeah. my life, a 40-year period, the cumulative, there's no comparison. Like when you look into the sky, the all of that pollution is red, white, and blue. And so like, yeah. not all of it, but like the vast majority of it. And, and I think we have to come to terms with that. This pollution sits in the air. It doesn't go away. So it accumulates. So we can't mm -hmm. just look at today and that's not fair. And, and that's a lot of the dialogue we've seen for decades in these UN climate talks and nothing's changed. We're, the, what's changed on that ground, what's changed is that we're experiencing impacts now and we think it's bad here. We think that the derechos we experience and the flooding and the tornadoes out of nowhere and uh, you know all of that stuff, it's making our food prices go out, the, up the droughts and fires in California. We think it's bad here. It is nowhere near what people are experiencing in the global South. And that is what has changed. And so there's a, there's a term of art called loss and damage, which is a lot of the focus of this particular UN meeting, because that is what people are experiencing now. It's not just things we can adapt to. It's not things we can prepare for. It's just loss. And when a country is facing like, oh, I have to take my flag down from in front of the UN because my country is going to cease to be habitable because of the actions of other countries, that's something that if we didn't already have the UN, we would have to invent the UN to deal with. And that's a part, yeah. that's a big part of the conversation right now. Yeah, thank you. No, it's super helpful and great perspective. Uh, we're getting towards the end of our time, Kea. I'm so grateful that you came on this morning and, and gave us a little bit of your time. Um, we've talked about all sorts of things, including federal and international climate work. There are a lot of individuals watching this, a lot of people who are grounded in communities or congregations across Georgia or the South. And, you know, what what's the next step for them? What should they be doing with, because oftentimes, you know, the climate crisis can be and is this sort of overwhelming, all-encompassing thing that can be difficult to figure out, how do I fit into this? How do I make a difference? Yeah, well, I mean, I think everybody has their own skill set and their own way of bringing something to the movement. So for some people, it might be art. For other people, it might be food. For some people, it might be, you know, like it, it, it might be, um, you know, planning. Um, but I think that the thing, we're at a moment where we can't afford to not have people engage just because they think their skill set isn't the right one. Um, you know, if you have mobility issues and can't leave your phone, leave your home, we still need you to text bank and phone bank. If you have, if you can go out there, we need you. Um, and so, so I just think like, I think, I think there's a, there's a, there's an aspect of 
sitting with oneself and figuring out how can I lean into this moment that requires so much of us as humanity. And in this moment in this country, we're really, we're kind of deciding like, is this going to be a country that is overrun by militant white nationalists like we saw on January 6th? Or is this going to be a country where we take care of each other? And that's that's a crossroads that is that is much broader than, than the climate justice movement, um, but requires all of us. So um, so yeah, so I, I mean, obviously if anyone's listening to this, they're already plugged in, they're already a massive contributor. And so like the other side of that coin is that we all need to act, but we can't all act at all the same time, always, or we will be exhausted. And so I think mm -hmm. the, the metaphor of a choir is also really important. Like look around, you know, like people, some, some people need to take a breath while other people keep singing. And, and that's how the choir, you know, maintains its beauty. And so, so for some people, it might be a breath time. For some people, it might be a singing time. If you sit, look around and see a lot of people taking a breath, it might be time to, 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 to raise your voice a little bit. Um, so, so I just think, you know, there's that, I, there's that twofold thing is like, we have to take care of ourselves because at the end, this is all about people and relationships, but also we have to agitate you know, we have to agitate. And as I started with, like, we don't, we don't get crops without plowing the ground. So we have yeah. to plow the ground, but not all at once and not 24 hours a day. Yeah, absolutely. Kaya, thank you so much, everyone. Kaya Chatterjee, Executive Director of the U.S. Climate Action Network. Um, thank you for taking some time this morning to be with us and talk about all this. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And we'll see you on the next episode of Coffee and Something Stronger. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Cody.